Hi, everyone. Welcome to 3GNY Stories Live, We Do Wednesday. Thanks for joining us on such a historic evening. A couple of weeks ago, we saw anti-Semitism rear its ugly head at the Capitol and our local Museum of Jewish Heritage. We were shaken to the core. Today, we saw a renewed promise for American democracy, and it reminds us to stay committed to our own promise to our grandparents and to all survivors to educate about intolerance. I'm Thyra Krauss a 3GNY board member and grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I'm thrilled to be here for our 13th We Do Wednesday. Tonight, we'll be featuring guest speaker, Allison Berg, who has a fascinating story to share. We welcome all of you who are tuning in for the first time, as well as those of, as well as those of you who regularly participate in our programs. We are grateful for the community. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and our supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. Founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3GNY's membership is still growing. Over the past 15 years, we've held diverse programs of all sizes around the New York area and played a leading role in launching other 3G groups around the country. Tonight's We Do Wednesday program showcases 3GNY's flagship educational initiative, We Do, which is short for We Educate. We've seen the heartbreaking studies stating the lack of Holocaust knowledge amongst recent high school and college graduates. The good news is that students who do receive high Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to ch challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. This is why we do is so critical today. It's a four week training program to teach grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family testimony in school classrooms. Through our grandparents' testimony, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often where small injustices are found on the playground, in the classroom and on the street because it's the easiest and most efficient way to act. By the time Nazi tanks roll in, it's too late. I've been speaking in classrooms for 10 years. The most heartwarming notes come from students explain, explaining that they plan to share my Bubby Eva story with others, they will, that they will strive to stand up against hate and bigotry, and most importantly, that they plan to learn more about the Holocaust. 3 Gen Y has trained over 300 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Washington, DC, and most recently around the country on Zoom since the pandemic hit. In 2020 alone, we trained 62 grandchildren more than ever before. Also in 2020, between speaking in schools, our live programming and our YouTube channel, more than 10,000 people heard our stories. In total, we do has impacted more than 30,000 students. Hope is not lost and we need to keep doing the work. You can help us accomplish this through a financial gift of any amount that will go directly toward training more speakers, thus reaching even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools, teachers, or students, and we provide our programming to schools completely free and aim to keep the cost of training to 3Gs as low as possible. There's a link with ways to donate in the chat, and we hope you'll consider making the gift. If you've already donated to us, thank you. We really appreciate it. And to everyone, by just being here tonight, you're helping us honor the memories of our grandparents and ensuring that never again is more than just an empty phrase. I'd now like to introduce a special guest in advance of Allison's presentation, who will speak briefly about our collaborations with 3Gs on the other coast. Aaron Tartovsky is a leader in San Francisco with 3GSF and will share a few words with us before introducing Allison. Aaron, thanks so much for being here tonight and for sharing the sacred responsibility with us. Thank you. I, I know we had discussed my last name and you nailed it. So thank you very much for that. Um, so as Farrah mentioned, I'm from San Francisco. Uh, I'm one of the founders of 3GSF. So what you all have built in New York, we are trying to build in San Francisco. Like you, we started with four of us. We are now 200. So we're a forum for grandchildren of survivors doing a lot of educational work, doing speaking work. Uh, and recently we started doing more collaborations with 3G groups here in California and LA, but also with you uh, in New York. And we're really excited about what that means. And I think there's a lot more we can do together as different chapters of, of, of grandchildren of survivors around the country and eventually around the world. And so I thank you all for letting me be here. And of course, for friends who have friends uh, in San Francisco who would want to get involved with us, please reach out to me or any of the folks here and they can connect you with me. 
Uh, I now have the special pleasure of introducing the speaker for tonight, Allison Berg. I think as we all know, we all share a connection as grandchildren of survivors. Allison and I actually share a very special one. Like me, her grandparents, uh, when they came to this country, ended up on a chicken farm in South Jersey, just like my grandparents. Allison grew up near that chicken farm just minutes away. Um, she graduated from the University of Michigan with degrees in communications and political science, and now works as a director at Group Gordon, which is a communications firm where she specializes in nonprofit work. She uses storytelling to advocate for meaningful causes and to enhance their impact. So she got involved uh, after hearing her, her own story in pieces over the years, and she joined We Do in January 2019 to put the full narrative of her grandmother's life together to share with students. Her participation in the program was inspired by a conversation with her little sister in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program when that, uh, her, her little sister was shocked to learn that she was just one degree of separation from a real survivor. And that someone from that historical period could still be alive. Allison hopes her participation in 3GNY helps more students easily connect to this not so ancient history and realizing what hate and intolerance is capable of destroying and what faith and love is, and, and, and what faith and love is capable of surviving. So with that, Allison, the floor is yours. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I, I also wanna just take a moment and thank 3GNY for helping me craft this story and giving me the opportunity to share it with students and even more widely with the community today. Um, as Farah touched on, the last few weeks have been a disturbing reminder of how important it is to continue to tell these stories. Um, one week from today is the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which sounds like a really long time ago. Um, but just two weeks ago, we saw people openly implying that the extermination of Jews in Auschwitz was not enough. Only the very last generation of survivors are still with us and keeping their stories alive with continued education and condemnation of this period of history is the only way that we can ensure it never happens again. But also that never again means not now and not to any group of people. As you know, I usually tell this story to a group of students anywhere from sixth to 12th grade. And I'd like to start by asking everyone listening to think back to the first time you learned about the Holocaust, whether it was in school or from family, how old you were, how the, how the topic was introduced. Um, I was in fifth grade when we learned about the Holocaust in school for the first time, but I already knew a few things. I knew I was Jewish and that made me different. I knew that my grandmother survived the Holocaust and that made her strong. And I knew Hitler was one of the worst, most evil characters in history. So when a boy in my class said he wished Hitler was still alive to finish the job, that he seemed pretty cool, I was devastated. I knew if Hitler were still alive, my grandmother would have suffered even more. Um, she would have been killed, I wouldn't have been born and there probably wouldn't be any Jews left alive. I realized that while we were learning the history of the Holocaust, we weren't learning the stories of the Holocaust. And I always took for granted how special my grandmother was. But I also realized that I could share her. I knew I could get this boy into a lot of trouble for saying what he did, but instead I arranged with my teacher to have my grandmother come into the class and tell her story. So this boy could meet my grandmother, Anna Cohn. And that is what you will all do today through me, is meet Anna Cohn. She was born in Hungary in 1918 in a town called Vats, about 25 minutes outside of the capital Budapest. She was a middle child. She had an older brother, Laszlo, and a much younger sister, Masha. Her father passed when she was in a teenager, but her mother kept the business going and they were a well-off middle-class Jewish family. They owned and operated a matzah factory that was adjacent to their home and owned other apartment buildings in town where people paid rent to them. There was no higher education for women in the town. So my grandmother was attending school in the city of Budapest where she studied several languages and wanted to be a surgeon. Laszlo taught her how to work on car engines and Masha would help make the handmade Shmira matzah um, while my grandmother helped maintain and run the machinery of the factory. 
She was daring. She rode a motorcycle and she liked adventure and she was engaged to a man named Joe. Vats had a thriving Jewish community with two synagogues. One was a more traditional Orthodox synagogue and the one my grandmother attended was the new modern Orthodox. And this is actually a picture of the Vats synagogue, um, I believe was taken in 1921. They were a religious family and went to synagogue every Saturday to pray and participate in the community. During the war, while Germany invaded countries across Europe and rounded up Jews, they mostly left Hungary alone. And this is because the Hungarian Royal Army reassured the Nazis they were already taking care of eradicating and oppressing Jews from the country on their own. Germany didn't need to come and expend their resources to enforce their ideology. Starting in May 1939, Hungary instituted anti-Jewish laws that mirrored the Nuremberg laws in Germany, such as taking away equal citizenship, uh, barring interfaith marriages, and limiting professional opportunities and economic opportunities for Jews. Some Jewish families left Vats because they saw what was happening across Europe, but my grandmother naively didn't think it would get that bad in Hungary if it hadn't already. In early 1944, my grandmother's brother Laszlo was forced to enlist in the Hungarian Royal Army, but Hungary had passed laws that prohibited Jews from serving among the regular Hungarians, so he was actually forced into a labor battalion. Um, it was dangerous slave labor, labor at the behest of the Hungarian army. In March of 1944, it was the Hungarian police, uh, she called the gender, that came to my grandmother's door and demanded the head of the household. In most households in her town, this was the father, but um, my grandmother's father had passed away and her older brother was already in forced labor. So they took her mother. Her mother was taken to a town called Savar, which was in the west side of Hungary, um, and it was transformed during the war into uh, an internment camp and later a concentration camp. And the only reason we know that she was there is because she wrote a letter to their old live-in maid named Kutka. Kutka was not Jewish, and so there was a better chance of it actually getting to her. It's pretty much a miracle that this letter even came through. We believe a benevolent Hungarian guard smuggled it out and sent it for her. The note is obviously in Hungarian, um, but I haven't had it translated. And it says that it's not the first letter that she's written, even though it's the only one that was received. She said, she's okay. Um, but she can't write too much information because if someone reads it along the way, she's afraid it would not get through or get them in trouble. She begs to know where her children are and that they are safe. And she asks Kutka to take care of her children, not to spare any expense, that she would pay her back. One thing my grandmother's family had was money, but money wasn't enough at this point in the war to keep anyone safe. The final solution was only to kill all of the Jews at all costs. In April of 1944, the gender police returned and gave my grandmother and her sister a day to pack and report to the local ghetto. Having seen people taken from their homes uh, and not returning, she knew that as soon as they stepped out of the gates, it would no longer be theirs. So my grandmother gathered valuable jewelry and photos and um, buried it outside the matzah factory. They packed a small suitcase with a change of clothes and a toothbrush and they were rounded up to the local ghetto. The local ghetto in Vats happened to be the grounds of her synagogue. So the place that she went weekly to pray and express her faith became a prison for that exact reason. They were forced to wear yellow stars to identify them as Jews, and they could not leave the ghetto without an escort. There wasn't much food to go around, but Kutka used to come and um, sneak them food into the ghetto. They were in the Vats ghetto for about a month uh, until it was evacuated and all the residents were loaded into cattle cars. There was about 100 people per each small car. They began a three-day journey without food, no water, no air, no bathroom. They didn't know where they were going. As they passed one town, my grandmother said that the townspeople started spraying water on the side of the train car. 
knowing that the people inside were literally dying of thirst to torture them. People scratched their faces against the side of the car to grab any drop of moisture that they could. Many died of thirst, hunger, and disease on the journey, but their bodies remained in the train cars. My grandmother told her sister to be strong. Being surrounded by dead bodies would become normal. When they arrived at Auschwitz, their suitcases were immediately taken and everyone was lined up. She was grateful to be out of the stale, putrid air um, of the cattle car, but the smell at Auschwitz was a new and different kind of horrific. There was music playing among shouting in German, which my grandmother actually was able to understand. She saw uh, the children, the young, being sent to the left and the Germans saying that there was a children's camp with better food that way. The others were sent to the right to the work camp. They saw the sign, Arbeit mach frei, work will set you free. When they got to the front in the line, she whispered to Musha, her sister, be strong, and said in perfect German, she's 16 years old. It was a lie. Musha was only 13, but it worked and they were able to stay together. We now know there was no German, or there was no camp, um, children's camp. There was only gas chambers to the left. They were forced into group showers. Their heads were shaved and they were given one striped shirt and a pair of shoes, and that's it. While most Jews who were imprisoned in Auschwitz had numbers tattooed on their arm, replacing their identity, my grandmother didn't. By the time she was imprisoned, they were no longer keeping track of their victims. They were in a rush to kill as many people as possible. My grandmother and Musha were not given beds or jobs in Auschwitz. They were just told to wait. And this made my grandmother anxious because she knew that those who weren't useful were at risk. They slept on the floor using their shoes as a pillow. They saw the gas chambers and learned from other inmates that's where the Nazis were killing and burning Jews. That's what the new awful smell was. She said the smell of burning bodies was so constant, it was 24 seven, that eventually, they got used to it. While they didn't have jobs, they saw people constantly digging, digging, digging these mass graves all over the camp. A month after arriving at Auschwitz, they were part of a group of women selected to be loaded onto another cattle car. They were taken to a camp outside of Berlin called Sachsenhausen. This particular camp during most of the war was filled with political prisoners, not Jews, because ridding Germany of Jews was the absolute primary goal. They didn't want them anywhere near Berlin, their cities and their people. But the Nazis were losing the war and they were desperate for free labor. So they shipped thousands of Jews and specifically many Hungarian Jews into Germany. Hungarian Jews were the last to be taken. They were not starved and tortured for as long in the camps. Um, so they were stronger than other populations and able to work. Every night in the cover of darkness so that no one in Berlin could see that there were Jews nearby, um, my grandmother walked to the Heinkel airplane factory. Um, and she worked on plane parts for Nazi bomber planes. They would return each morning before sunrise. This is an actual picture of the Heinkel airplane factory in 1944. You can see the swastika on the tail of the plane. Um, and this is the model of bomber plane um, in the factory. Um, once, uh, so one of the foremen in the factory actually took a liking to Musha and he once brought her an apple uh, and she, he told her to hide behind the machines and eat it. An apple at this time in history to give to a Jew was an unthinkable luxury. Um, and this man would have gotten in a lot of trouble if someone had seen his act of kindness. Not everyone was this kind. Another day, a Nazi handed a metal pipe to my grandmother. Holding a gun to her head, he instructed her to beat the woman working next to her. She froze and she was hit hard with the barrel of the gun. The Nazi repositioned it, pressed it firmly against her skull and told her to swing. So she closed her eyes and she swung. In that moment, the Nazis had not only starved and beaten her, taken away her home and her family and her agency and her identity, but they took away her humanity. And she vowed never again to be an agent of their violence. Using the knowledge of car engines and machines from her childhood, 
she purposefully sabotaged the airplane parts in ways that the untrained guards wouldn't recognize. And it is true and recorded that Nazi bomber planes made in that factory at that time crashed without explanation. Historians attribute it to women working in the airplane factory. And that was my grandmother. I didn't actually know this story until a couple years ago. I thought for a long time, my grandmother's entire time in the war was at Auschwitz. So when she in her late nineties at the time mentioned something about being in Germany during the war, I corrected her. I said, no, no grandma, Auschwitz is in Poland. And she turned to me and she told me this story. Actually, she didn't really tell it to me. She, she shouted it at me. She had light blue eyes and they were wide and filled with fear and urgency. And at first I thought she was reliving, she was having flashbacks and she was reliving this moment and I felt terrible, but it soon became clear she was not in the past. She was very much in the present with me. And the fear in her eyes was a warning. This wasn't a scary story. This wasn't a tall tale. This actually happened to her and it could happen to anyone. It could happen to me if those in power lead with hatred and fear and who, when people don't speak up against it. Back at the camp during the day when they weren't working, they slept on stacked wooden platforms. They had one coarse blanket and a wooden plank. My grandmother would routinely sneak out in the middle of the day and steal cooked potato peels from the trash of the Nazis food. They didn't get potatoes, the Nazis did. Um, if found, she would have been shot and many were, but uh, she said that this trashed, cooked, plain potato peel was like candy to her. And it is the only reason they had enough food to survive. They were whipped, tortured, and starved for a year. She told Masha every day to be strong. My grandmother didn't know when this would end, but they started hearing more and more planes flying overhead and the guards would yell at them to take cover, go inside. The allied forces were advancing and the camp evacuated on April 21st, 1945. 33,000 prisoners were instructed to march Northwest in groups. They walked without food or water for several days straight. She dug up roots and picked bark off the tree to eat when she could. People who stumbled or fell from fatigue or hunger, they were immediately killed as the group marched on. This is the first time my grandmother says that she felt like she was not going to make it and that she couldn't go any further. This time it's Musha, little Musha, who holds her up, pulls her along and tells her to be strong. And this saved her life. They entered the Black Forest and they were told to go to sleep. And after days of starvation and constant marching, they fell asleep and they didn't ask questions. When they woke up, the Germans were gone and the Russian army was there to take control. This was more than 120 miles from Sachsenhausen where they started. 120 miles without food, water, or sleep. An estimated 15,000 people perished in the death march from starvation, exhaustion, and illness. Those who survived were taken to displaced persons camp. My grandmother said that we can thank the Russians for freeing them, but they were horrible in their own right. The Russian soldiers were going from cabin to cabin to steal anything they could get their hands on. And my grandmother covered herself and Masha in horse poop so they would smell and deter the Russians from coming in and raping them like they did so many others. After a few weeks at the camp, my grandmother was strong enough to return to her hometown. And as expected, people were living in her house. She dug up her photos and valuables from outside the matzah factory. She dug up a golden locket with pictures of her mother and father, this locket that she later gave to me. She learned the prisoners of Savar, where her mother was kept, were ultimately evacuated to Auschwitz and murdered. Her brother ended up in Buchenwald, a concentration camp in Germany, but was alive pretty late into the war. They were told that he died when the Nazis set fire to the camp to destroy evidence, just days before liberation. She had no home, no belongings, and most of her family had been killed but she didn't know what happened to her fiance, Joe. So she got on a train to go to his hometown and see if they could get married and start a new life. 
and the train got stuck in a snowstorm. It was stuck in that snowstorm that she met a man also from Hungary who also survived Auschwitz. He was in the camps longer and he did have a tattoo as well as a shaved head that matched hers. But st he still had hope for the future and faith in humanity, things that she had mostly lost. His positivity charmed her and they were engaged 11 days later. That would be my grandfather. Just to give you a sense of their personalities after the war, I've heard stories about some of my grandparents' early dates. They went to the famous Budapest baths and my grandfather went to lay his head on her lap, which she thought was quite presumptuous for the time. And so she quickly moved out of the way and he hit his head hard on the concrete. When he kissed her for the first time, she was taken aback and he slapped and she slapped him. Um, he said, if you don't like it, you can give it back. Those who know me won't be surprised that I'm related to this bold flirtatiousness and her sense of independent self-agency. But what I take away from it is that the Nazis killed a lot of people, a lot of spirits, and a lot of faith. A small but mighty act of revenge is that they believed in, found, and spread love after experiencing such hatred. They had a baby girl while in Hungary and decided to move to America. It was hard to get permission um, to, to go to America at that time because so many thousands of people were trying to leave Europe. My grandparents said they had farming skills, which apparently my grandfather did, which TBD, I don't know if that's true, but they made it to America and they received $100 in a loan from a Jewish charity and they bought a few chickens and some land in New Jersey. And with that, they created a chicken farm with 20,000 chickens and they sold eggs to local grocery stores. Later, they bought some rental buildings like my grandmother's uh, parents owned in Hungary. They learned English, started a business and continued to freely and proudly practice Judaism. The German government offered to pay for the removal of my grandfather's tattoo and he declined so that they could never erase any evidence of his torture. My grandmother sent for Musha, who was still living in Europe with extended family and told her to come marry my grandfather's cousin. So she did, and she moved into a home down the street. There wasn't a synagogue within walking distance to their home. So my grandfather who had been trained at a yeshiva in Hungary started a small congregation on the ground floor of their home as the rabbi. It grew until they had enough congregants to purchase their own building and get out of my grandmother's living room. Um, but my grandmother passed away over 30 years ago. Um, that synagogue still exists today. After her husband passed, my grandmother kept the businesses running just like her mom had. She had four daughters and the smallest one in her arms with the sassy looking face is my mother, obviously. Um, she had six grandchildren, including me and six great grandchildren so far. She and Masha lived down the street from each other their entire lives. Um, that's them together. My grandmother's sitting. Uh, when my brother and I went back to Vats uh, to visit her hometown, she refused to look at the photos. She never looked back. But here's some photos of the Vats synagogue and me walking through the town square in 2017. And if you remember the synagogue picture from earlier, they reconstructed the synagogue to be uh, as, as similar as possible to how it was. And it is uh, still a functioning synagogue for, for Jews and bots today. My grandmother passed away in her 100th year of life. When she did speak about her story, this story, she spoke about the danger of intolerance and, sp and spreading hatred and her unapologetic identity as a Jew. I do believe part of her devotion to the faith was to spite those who tried to take it from her. She was stubborn like that, but it's how she survived. She didn't really identify mainly as a Holocaust survivor. She would not let that dictate who she was and she refused German reparations for the majority of her life. She didn't talk much about her experience with her own children, but when her grandkids started asking questions, she opened up, realizing the significance of her experience and having it preserved. 
The most important lesson she passed down to me is that it is only your values that define you. And no matter how different people can seem, their religion, gender, economic status, or background, it is your values that make you most similar or most different from others. She would describe someone as our kind of people. And she didn't mean Jewish. She meant a mensch, a good person, someone of integrity. She taught me to always look for the shared values. Her values were family, generosity, hard work, and fierce independence. She taught me to be kind, but to stand up for those values when they're challenged. And above all else, be strong. Wow. Allison, thank you so much for gifting us with your family story. We're now going to open it up for questions. If you have a question for Allison, please type it into the Q&A. Due to the high volume of questions we typically receive, we won't be able to answer every single question. If your question is not addressed tonight, please email info at 3gnewyork.org and we'll relay it to Allison. Thank you for your understanding. All right, so Allison, um, the first question tonight, what happened um, when your grandmother presented to your elementary school class um, after the comment your classmate made? Yeah, I I remember I remember watching everyone else's face um, rather than watching my grandmother's, and I remember everyone being so um, captured with her story, and uh, there was there was crying and shock, um, and I think everyone really even though we did have a Jewish community in Princeton, it wasn't like someone's first time meeting a Jew or maybe even a Holocaust survivor. It was the first time that someone had directly told that kind of story to them. And people were really moved. And I think, um, you know, the boy also was extremely moved um, by the story and never bothered me ever again. Um, and when my grandmother passed away two years ago, I had friends from my fifth grade class reach out to me and recall that story and um, tell me that it was such a formative part of their education. Um, and those messages mean the world to me and it's why I do this. Um, Allison, I have a question for you. Um, how do students respond when you tell the story? I mean, we all obviously felt how powerful it was. And so how, how was the response from the students? A lot of shock. Um, I did tell this story in a way that I knew I'd be speaking to adults, but for the most part, I don't dilute the story very much. Um, I think it's important to know how bad it was in order to understand how bad it can get. Um, and so definitely a lot of shock, there's gasps, there's like people doing double takes, you know, up from their desk and, um, really reflective questions. I'm always surprised at the introspection of these students. I have gotten the question of, you know, how did your grandmother believe in God after that? Um, which is such an interesting question from a, you know, 14 year old kid. Um, and a lot of questions about like how she could have survived the things that I described. And my honest answer is, I, I don't know. Uh, Allison, how did you learn about your grandmother's story? I know I asked everyone to think back about when they first learned about the Holocaust, and I wish I had a better answer of when I learned about it, because I feel like it's always just been layered into my family and my history. I grew up Jewish. My grandmother had a heavy Hungarian accent and used words that were not English, but I didn't know weren't English. And then I would use with people and they didn't know what I was saying. Um, I kept kosher. I still keep kosher. So I had to understand things about my faith and what I could and couldn't eat. And, and I just feel like the stories came out piecemeal um, as appropriate as a child. But I mostly, I would say from my mother, who's um, the daughter of my grandmother, obviously. Um, it's my maternal grandmother. And um, my grandma herself, who would share bits and pieces here and there. When you asked her direct questions, she, she would tell you. Um, and I learned things when she came to my classroom too. 
Um, and I, I would say the majority of the connecting the dots, I actually learned um, when my grandmother passed away during her Shiva, I sat down with my great aunt, her sister, Masha, and I recorded us talking and me just asking all of the questions. And she was kind enough to take that already sad time to explain to me some of the things that I had been missing. And I was able to actually research um, and adjudicate like everything she was saying. She has such an amazing detailed memory. It's pretty incredible and she's watching. So hi, Masha. Um, well, I have a question uh, about your grandfather. Um, based on what you've shared, he seemed like a fun guy to be around. Uh, so you obviously know your grandmother's story. Um, what about your grandfather's story? Yeah, my grandfather passed away um, before I was born. So I didn't have that direct relationship with him to learn his story. Um, what I know is, I guess, through my mom, my aunt, um, and my grandmother. So he was 10 years older than my grandmother. So my grandmother was in her mid twenties. He was in his mid thirties. He had a wife and two babies. Um, and they were, his wife and, and sons were killed. Um, he was sent, I believe directly to Auschwitz. He was there for a longer period of time. Um, and my understanding is it was part of his job as one of the stronger Hungarian men to carry the bodies from the gas chambers to graves. So very popular question. What town did your grandmother move to? Um, so originally they moved, the, the chicken farm was in Hamilton, New Jersey. Um, and then they moved to Trenton, New Jersey, um, where my mom grew up. And then um, her older years in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. So just central Jersey in and around the Princeton area. Well, I think, I don't know if we've talked about this, but my family ended up in Vineland, New Jersey. And I think uh, there's a lot of interesting history about the survivors who ended up in Jersey as, as chicken farmers. So again, I'm glad that we share that very special connection. All roads lead back to South Jersey chicken farms. When COVID's over, we'll, we'll grab chicken at Joe's Chicken Shack, your grandparents. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Um, now, here's an interesting question, and I think a lot of people um, maybe deal with this, especially with grandparents or survivors, but this is a question from David. Why refuse uh, German reparations? I mentioned the fierce independence, right? Um, she was, some would say stubborn. Um, she definitely, I also mentioned the $100 loan that she got. She would also tell you, I paid that back. Um, she really believed in earning everything that she um, had. And I think she didn't want a thing. She did not want to owe anyone anything. And taking money from the German government to her felt um, like it was okay, as if anything could repair, like reparations, right? That comes from repair. I don't know. I made that up. But, um, <laughs> you know, nothing could ever repay and she didn't want anything to do with that. Later in life, when they would pay for some um, like ambulatory care, um, she did take reparations to pay for, um, you know, AIDS and stuff like that while she was still living in her home. So later in life she did um, after some coaxing, but um, yeah, I just think she didn't want anything to do with that past. Uh, did your grandmother ever find her fiance? We don't know what happened to Joe. We have a picture of him and he was really cute. Um, it was one of the pictures that she must have buried. Um, so we we don't know, she never heard from him. So we're assuming that he didn't make it or maybe he found a lovely wife on a train somewhere. We hope the best for Joe. Um, so uh, this is a question from Jay. Uh, are there still Jews living and I'm gonna help me with the pronunciation, Vats? Vats. Right? Are there still Jews living in Vats? And sort of a follow-up question to that was, you know, you mentioned your grandmother didn't want to see the photos. How was it for you uh, being back there? Um, so I do believe there are Jews in Vats because that synagogue is still active. Um, 
and um, it was it was restored, but I do believe there's a congregation there. Um, so yes, I don't know how many, but there are definitely Jews there. Um, and the situation for Jews in Hungary is not so great right now um, in general, but um, my brother and I decided to go there. Um, it was amazing. We had addresses of her home. We went to her father's grave, which is still there um, because he died before the war. So he had a normal um, gravestone and we were able to go visit the grave um, and walk around town. And um, it was one of the best trips I think we've ever had. It was so meaningful um, to walk the streets that she did. And um, it was sad. I think it was sad in a way too of like, I remember my brother and I taught like my brother saying like, do you think that our great grandfather would have ever thought his great grandchildren would have come back to his grave. And I said to my brother, I don't think he had any idea that we wouldn't still be in Hungary. Like, I don't think he could have ever imagined what had gone down. So I don't think he would have thought we'd be anywhere else. So not a question, but Adele, who's the mother of one of our 3G speakers, uh, wanted to let you know that your presentation was wonderful and your grandmother is certainly smiling down on you and to please continue telling your story and also that the locket is gorgeous. Thanks, Adele. Um, so here's a quiz, an interesting question. So in the current times um, during COVID, are you still speaking to students? Um, I would love to speak to students. It's been a while just because I think teachers are so overwhelmed. So everyone, all of your teacher friends, tell them about this awesome free program and have them reach out because the teachers love it. Um, the speakers love it. And it's, again, like I said, it happened a long time ago, but not that long ago. And there's a lot that we can still learn from it today. And so I, I just think it's more important than ever. I, I do find that the students that relate to it the most, I mean, I don't really speak to Jewish students. It's students who have experienced hate themselves and they don't look like me. Thank you. Um, just to reiterate that, if anyone watching knows a teacher who would like one of our speakers to come into their classroom via Zoom or any virtual platform, we do them all, um, please email we do scheduling at 3gnewyork.org and we will be happy to send one of our fabulous speakers, even Allison, um, to your classroom. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Allison for speaking tonight and for sharing your grandmother's story and Aaron, thanks for being part of our program. Thanks again to all of you for joining us. We're glad you took the time to hear Allison speak words that must never be forgotten. If you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope you'll consider making one now. Um, please refer to the chat for ways that you could donate. Thank you. Also, if you have, as I said, if you have connections with educators, um, please get in touch with us. Um, we hope to see you again soon. We have some great virtual events coming up, including more We Do Wednesdays. On February 3rd, Emmy award-winning journalist Stacey Delacott will share the story of her grandfather, Otto, who is one of the Nazis' longest surviving prisoners. And on January 27th, um, in honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, 3GNY, along with 3G groups, including 3G San Francisco, from around the country are proud to present a 3G perspective preserving the memory of Holocaust survivors. And we've partnered with the Marlene Meyerson JCC in Manhattan, in Manhattan's Carol Zabar Center for Film to bring you After Schindler, Hollywood's third generation of Holocaust films. In this virtual film class, participants will investigate various films for six Mondays beginning on January 25th. We'll be sending out an email tomorrow with details and registration links for all these events, as well as a recording of tonight's program. You can also check out our past We Do Wednesday speakers on 3JNY's YouTube channel. Thanks again for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. We're grateful as always for your support. Thank you.